Hey, everybody. Hey, Austin. So, uh, should we wait another minute or so? Sharon, you know that George is joining us? Hi, is George joining us? Uh, I haven't heard that he isn't, but he wasn't in work today. Okay. All right. Five is a quorum, right? Yes. Okay. Then, um, then let, let's launch. Angie, are we good? Do you want to say your thing? Welcome to this meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee. We are currently being recorded to the cloud. This video will be uploaded to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. And at this time, I'd like to turn things over to the chair, Professor Austin Serrett. Thank you so much, Angie. Okay, so the first uh, order of business is to just have you signify that you are present. Christine? Here. Alex? Sorry, here. Sean? Here. Sharon? Here. Austin? Uh, thank you all. So I'm, we're hoping that a few others of our committee will join us, but we're going to launch right in. Uh, three sets of minutes to approve, July 22nd, uh, August 9th, and August 23rd. So let's take them in order. Uh, move to a, a motion to approve the minutes of July 26th. So moved. A second. Second. Uh, comments uh, on the minutes. Corrections to the minutes. Okay, we ready to vote fortunate. on the minutes. I'm gonna ask you again to signify vocally your approval of the minutes. Christine. Uh, Alex. Um, I'm gonna abstain because I haven't had a chance to read them. Yeah, when did we get those? I saw today we got the 23rd. So they should be should have been in the packet. If people have not had a chance to read them, we will lay them over. Have you read any of these minutes? Okay, I'm, let's- I'm let's, sorry, Austin, they're not in the packet. Then let's lay them over, including the minutes for the 23rd. Okay, next item on the agenda is the report, a report from the town manager on pro project status. Paul um, indicated that he was in another meeting and he would be a little late. So my suggestion is that we hold off on hearing Paul's report until Paul can come. So next item of business, a financial update, Sean. Thanks Austin. So we have um, two things. Uh, one, uh, I'm happy to announce that the amendment with a designer has been signed. So we oh, now great. have that all in place and Craig has a copy, which is good. Um, and then along those lines, we do have the the two invoices from the designer just to keep uh, you know consistent with our practice. I don't think they've been formally approved at this committee level yet, unless someone tells me otherwise. Um, so I would look to bring both of those invoices up now for a vote. And okay. I can share my screen if anybody wants to see them, but yeah. they're consistent with the... Um, Share real quick. Thank you, Sean. So the first invoice is for May, and it's the first uh, half of, or roughly first half of schematic design for 163,500. Uh, this has been reviewed and approved by Colliers. Great. And then so, the second invoice, we, maybe we can just vote them in a batch, is yeah. uh, the okay. balance of the um, the balance of schematic design. So the total amount is the $327,000 between the two invoices. So you're uh, gonna make a motion to approve that we pay $327,000? Yeah, I move that we approve the May and June invoices for Fine Gold Alexander. Thanks so much, is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion about these invoices? Okay, I want to note before we vote the presence of, of Xander and of Anika. Xander, can you just uh, let us know that you can hear us? Xander? 
Okay, so it's broken up a little bit, but his hand is up. Try again. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Thank you, Xander. Anika? I can hear I can you. I can hear you, and my only question is... Xander? I don't know what Xander's question is. Xander, can you type it yeah, in? Yeah, sorry, screen? I just was switching phone settings. Okay. Uh, is that better? Yeah. Great. My only question was, uh, Sean, what was the thing that we got signed with the design team? Uh, our contract amendment. So we had an original contract and we needed to, we've been working really for the last several months to um, get an amendment to that contract for the, basically the rest of the project. Um, and so it lays out the cost for schematic design, design development, um, construction documents, bidding, construction management, everything. Um, it lays out the costs associated with each of those phases. Um, and what the invoices that we're approving tonight are for the work that they've already completed for schematic design. That's awesome. The only other uh, just follow up to that is, do any of those amendments have force majeure language in the event that um, the project becomes untenable to fund to the end? Uh, we've included language in the amendments uh, that speak to that. That's um, that basically we are responsible um, for the portion of the project that is completed. Um, and that the only uh, basically clause that we have, to, well, not the only clause, but one clause we have to be mindful of is if we bring the project to bidding, then we're required to pay 75% of the design fee um, if we bring it to bidding and then decide not to move forward at that point. Um, up until that point, it's it goes section by section or phase by phase. Xander, did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the thanks for the question. So, any other question about the invoices? Okay, Christine, vote to approve. Recommend the payment of the invoices. Yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. Uh, Sharon? Yes. Uh, Xander? Yes. Thank you. Anika? Yes. Thank you. Sean? Yes. And Austin votes yes. Sean, thanks for that. So I wanted to raise a question about um, finances thinking, thinking forward, but Again, I guess I'll, I'll wait until Paul comes. And if we are ready to end before Paul comes, then I'll raise the question at that, um, at that point. Okay. Um, Collier's project leaders. Craig, thank you for joining us. Certainly. Um, uh, if it's okay with you, Austin, I will share my screen. Please do. All right. So the first thing to review um, is the schedule. So here's, oh, let me make that a little bit bigger. So here's the schedule we've been uh, working with. Um, as before, you know, our red line is where we are today, the beginning of September. As before, I've got some striped shapes that I've put in there showing yeah. uh, that we have, that things are, are slipping a little bit. Um, between the end of schematic design and the start of design development. So we've completed schematic design, but we have, uh, the town has not given um, Feingold Alexander the um, okay to move into design development. So we know that uh, that will have a little impact on the schedule. Um, uh, are there any questions about that? Uh, that's sort of all there is to report at this time. Any question about the schedule that's on the screen? Yeah, sure. Uh, just some interpreting this right, um, Craig. The June milestone. Are are you saying that moves to December? The um, anticipated MBLC grant disbursement. Yes. Um, so that update is a product of two different um, things. One that um, disbursement is tied to the completion of construction documents. So just by virtue of us having uh, some schedule slippage, that moved out. However, the MBLC also issued a letter 
stating that they were going to withhold that until the end of the bid phase. So once bids were um, received and a contract has been signed. Um, so, so no matter now, what, we're, we're looking at FY24 for that second payment. Yes. Okay. Yep, for sure. So that's why that one it, it slides more than sort of everything else. Okay. And once things, once the dust settles and we uh, have a path forward, um, you know, I'll, I'll take a, a fresh look at the schedule, clean it all up. So we won't be just forever looking at this kind of um, patched together version. Um, and so then we'll have from that point forward, a nice clean understanding and plan. All right, I see Alex has her hand up, Alex. Thanks. Um, so I want to make sure I heard what you said correctly. So the MBLC regulations state when we get to the end of a design phase and one fiscal year after the first payment that we're supposed to get the second payment. And they're now saying that instead of following those regulations, they're going to wait until the end of bid phase to give us that payment. Um, so, yes, my understanding is that um, not only is it the next fiscal year after the first disbursement, but it's also tied, you know, just part of the regulations is it's connected to the completion and acceptance of the construction documents. But, okay, so, so that's the regulations sort of, you know, it's published on the website. But then beyond that, we've uh, recently got correspondence that indicates they will, they actually want to wait until the end of the bid phase to make that disbursement. Um, Why? And it's, it's the letter, to, to paraphrase the letter, they are concerned about um, the viability of this project based on the gap between the budget and the estimated costs. And so okay. instead of um, giving that money or dispersing that um, money um, and then the project be found to uh, to be terminated at the end of you know bid phase before moving into construction. They said that they want to see that the um, that the town is moving forward with construction. Okay, so just so I'm hearing this correctly, so basically the MBLC is worried because of the delays that we have been in at this moment that the project has uncertainty. So we're basically by continuing to delay jeopardizing the funding that the MBLC is. Paying us? Um, I don't think it's a time. Uh, they didn't talk too much about the time delay. It was more a concern that um, that if the bids come in and they're even higher, say, than predicted or higher than the town, um, the community can afford. They didn't want to make that disbursement and then three months later find out that you know uh, project's not moving forward. So it's more uh, like you said, sort of concern um, about the um, sort of the risk. Of, of the project not moving forward. So if if I may, Austin, can I? Yeah, please, go ahead. So, so if we as a town uh, can put together some sort of, pro I mean, I, I share this concern myself, right? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, have echoed on more than one occasion that, you know, we were told, when was our last meeting? That we are increasing costs by the week, right? And while we are looking for, you know, hundred thousand dollars, let's say in savings, which is important, we are at the same time putting, let's say, three hundred thousand dollars in cost back on the table. And so, I have a certain measure of frustration around that. Um, and we, the trustees, are offering to do all the fundraising to keep it off town, um, but we are not the ones necessarily making the decision. So it sounds like if I guess I'm wondering if the MBLC, if we can come up with some sort of certainty agreement, right, between the trustees and the town around project certainty. Um, I'm wondering if they're amenable to put it back on the schedule. Because I understand, I have concern about, you know, raising money when I'm not controlling the process. <laughs> can I can I jump in to Austin real quick? Please, on, on, please. Uh, one thing just to keep in mind too, I, so the, the important, so, it looks like either way it's coming in FY24 um, because the original schedule had it coming on June of 2023. Construction documents now are not going to be finalized until it looks like September. Um, so one way or another, it's coming in FY24 based on this schedule. Um, 
sort of the big the thing we were trying to avoid was not getting a payment in FY23 because then that pushes everything out of fiscal year. But it looks like in any event, based on the current schedule, it's going to be pushed out that one more year. But everything you said, I think, is right, Alex, in terms of still trying to uh, advocate to the MBLC to uh, make that payment at the end of construction documents. It'll get it to the town a few months um, earlier than what they're proposing, but it's still going to be an FY24, which means the next payment won't come till 25 and then 26 and then 27. Alex, does that help? Yeah, I mean, I guess for my own purposes, I mean, I've been immensely frustrated and I don't even know at who because there's so many, I don't know who to be frustrated with, but I've been immensely frustrated by the very clear direction that we received from the designers and the OPM about timelines and schedules and that we're not adhering to them and that we are continuing to increase costs. And again, it's the trustees who are taking on that additional cost through our fundraising efforts. And so for me, I really, really, really need a schedule that everyone can agree to, that everyone can stick to, and that we can have some cost certainty and some project certainty around. And so I, don't know if this is it. I don't know, you know, I, I don't, I'm not even sure who's making decisions at this point, but I really, really need some clarity around the process, the who and the dates because we're just making this project more and more expensive. Um, and I, we need to find cuts, we need to do it quickly, we need to be efficient about it. And then we need to either decide to go forward or not go forward. But the more we delay, the more we delay, the more we delay. Delay is a decision, right? So I would love to have some certainty around timelines and decisions. And that's not necessarily this group, but I don't know who it is, but just putting it out there. And maybe that's a later conversation. I, I, I need you to be a little, uh, that I'm just having timelines and decisions about what? So you're not talking about this timeline because there it is in front of us, right? So when you say clarity about timelines and decisions, could you say a little bit more about what it is that you're hoping for? Sure. Uh, we have been very clearly told from a designer in the OPM that we need to move into the design phase. We are still in schematic design. Yeah. Schematic design is the barest, barest minimum of design work. And so in order for us to really dig in deep to the details, we have to move into design. Um, and I want to know when we are going to make the decision and who is making the decision that we move forward into design. And uh, from what I understand, we won't have price certainty until we get to the bid phase. And we saw, I think initially that there was a $1.4 million cost to that, which now is up to two. And I'm assuming as uh, Xander so rightly pointed out. And then uh, yeah, I, now, now that I understand that clause, right? About the bid phase that you talked about, Sean, now I understand why that number I think went up. Um, and again, right? I mean, the designers just like the MBLC are hedging their bets because we are not moving forward. Um, so do we need to make decisions about getting to a price certain? And what does that mean? Are, are the trustees paying for that? Is the town paying for that? Are we both paying for that? I mean, right right now, the onus seems completely on us, the trustees, and yet we're not the ones, we've made our decision. We made our decision a couple of weeks ago. We're ready to go, but we're bearing the cost of the delays. So I don't know whether town is gonna pitch in because of these delays or what. So I just, I need some clarity so we can make a plan and move forward. So Austin, can I respond? Yeah, to before you do, Sean, uh Craig, just for a minute, could you take down your screen share? Because I, I think it'd be good to see each other's face as we talk about this. Sean? Um, so just a couple of things. I think one, I, I mean, the town manager gets here. Um, <laughs> hopefully that will be part of his report in terms of we had the, the initial conversation with the finance committee and then what the process looks like going forward. Um, and I'll just put out there that we have reached out to uh, the designer and the OPM just to find out what their monthly mm -hmm. rates would be. We sort of know the, the uh, the fee for a whole section um, like design development or construction documents, but we've also reached out to say what would um, one month at a time if we want to keep it going to your point of, to try to avoid delays while decisions being made, um, what would that monthly cost be? So we've reached out to them and I think Craig got me that information today. So we have some more information to consider. Alex? 
I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, do, do we need to wait till the town manager gets here to have a more full conversation or like, or, when is that decision being made, Sean? Like, like, here's my concern, right? Like we meet every two weeks or like, like sorry, I'm, my corporate background is driving me insane. <laughs> like, we'll talk about it in two weeks, right? Like, so if we've done that, who's making that decision that we move forward? Like I, I, Right. So it's, it's ultimately the town manager's decision, from what I can tell, in terms of the contract and moving from one stage to the next, it's pretty clear that the town manager uh, makes that decision. Um, you know, I appreciate your frustration. Um, I don't think it's quite as simple as sort of the, the way you're framing it, but um, but in terms of your question about who decides if we move forward, uh, the town manager gives the direction to the designer to move from one stage to the next. So uh when paul is here we'll, we'll come back to this but i do want to say um uh i think that there are conversations going on in the in town among the leadership of the town to figure out the best way to move forward in making the decisions um i take it that's why there was a meeting of the finance committee to try to lay out for the leadership of the town first through the finance committee what is going on with this project and uh, to provide as much information as possible. The library director did as usual a great job in providing information and the finance committee had some more questions. We'll provide some more information. Uh, so those conversations are going on. I hope that Paul will be able to give us a little clarity about when they're going to be concluded and how's that going to go forward. But there's of course another another question which i don't know whether alex is raising this question uh, and that is if we go forward with design development and get to the bid phase uh there'll be another decision point right that's also part of your was that also part of your question alex yeah i mean yes we're going to get to the bid phase and we're going to create another decision point and then i want to know what happens i mean do we go through this whole one month, two month delay again? Do we, like, yeah. who's making that decision? Do we have, so I just want some certainty around, I wonder what the rules of the game are. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's yet another thing to talk about, which is at the end of, if if we go forward with design development, as this committee has recommended to the town manager, uh, and we got to figure out when that decision will be made and when all those things will be tied up then there'll be another decision point later on and alex is raising the question about when how will that decision be made who will make it in what time frame is that right did i get it right okay so i see xander and then sean xander i just wanted uh as long as we're waiting for town manager um i've been curious what other projects that have also won this grant are doing right now. Um, have we had any correspondence with them? Because I find it hard to believe they're not also crunched to, you know, hit 2018 money, uh, 2022 costs. Great. So Sharon is going to inform you about a meeting that was held this morning. Sharon? Yeah, so um, there is another initiative um, that that we've just started working on. I met today uh, with Lynn Griesemar, the town council president, along with Senator Comerford and Representative Dom, um, looking to join forces with the other 13 libraries from across the state who are experiencing the same uh, escalation problems that we are. And so we're looking to join forces between libraries and, and municipal leaders and the, the state and local representatives so that we can ask the state to cover this, this escalation costs for these libraries. So that's um, another initiative that, that we're hoping to help fill this, the gap for all of these libraries. And more detail will be laid out for the Board of Trustees of the Jones Library about uh, any of those initiatives so that the board can express its views and support for those initiatives and can be willing to have Amherst involved in it. I take it that the town, the town manager, the town council president, the council will also have to weigh in on how we pursue 
or if we pursue how we pursue such a such an such an initiative. Thank you, Sharon. Sean and then Christine. Yeah, I just also wanted to point out that there the town council meeting on Monday night has the Jones Library on it. Um, and then there is a finance committee the next day that, that the topic will also be the that's pretty much the only topic at this point will also be the the library project. So next week there'll be two meetings on this. Thank you. Christine. Yeah, um, that meeting that Sharon went to sounds great. Joined forces sounds great. You know, multiple people feeling the pain, but, um, and I hear that more details are coming. But just we're back to that timeline. I feel like I'm following up on Alex and, you know, we need time, right? Now, like the next couple of weeks, it, like, it, and I assume that that initiative, is there any kind of timeline? I don't know. King would be take months. no right now there's no real time well the timeline that we have is the our let uh joe and mindy will be reaching out to the other uh legislators on monday um i've already reached out to all of the librarians and lynn is going to reach out to her her colleagues across the state so we're hoping to make this quick but what once we have a you know a critical mass of uh, uh of folks that we can join forces with then we'll take it to the next level. You know, we want to work with the MBLC on this and the governor's office, and we'll see where it goes. Is that okay, Christine? Yeah, thanks. So I take it that that these efforts at the state level are subject not to our timeline, but to theirs. And we can articulate, I was not part of the meeting today, um, we can articulate what our needs are for time, but, um, and I, I'm sure that our representatives would have heard that clearly, uh, but how fast any of this can move, uh, whether it can produce any results, uh, you know, there's the Deerfield letter that uh, to the governor about ARPA money, and how that will proceed. That's all, I think, kind of above our pay grade in terms of setting the, the time. But I take it, again, I wasn't there, that Sharon made clear to um, the people that she met with that there was some, I don't know, urgency uh, to uh, getting progress and answers. And uh, I believe that it's important to get answers whether those answers are yes, we can help you or no, we can't. Uh, because the uncertainty about whether or not we're gonna get help, more help through the state processes uh, has an effect on other decisions that are gonna be made about the financing of the project and the future of the project. So uh, I again, Sharon, you might just wanna be clear with everybody, was there clarity in that meeting about the need for sooner is better than later and an answer is better than we'll see? Yes. Yeah, so yes, they know all of that. And based on the experience that uh, my conversations that I've had with the librarians, several of them who are in the same boat that we are, are in the process of receiving updated cost estimates. And there are a couple. So we're lucky our cost estimate is only a 30% increase and others, uh, their, their increases are up as high as 50 plus percent. So uh, time is of the essence for all of us. Okay, so any other questions on this? And again, we'll come back to this question, Alex, especially about the town thing when Paul when Paul arrived, but I appreciate you raising it in re relationship to the time frame that Craig laid out. So Craig, back to you. Thank you, Austin. All right, I'll share my screen again and we'll move on to the second, oops. Move on to the uh, second topic which is the uh, value management or value engineering or cost reduction list. So this is a list that was reviewed um, at the design subcommittee. The design subcommittee uh, made recommendations uh, for this committee um, relative to which, which items on this list they thought uh, we should incorporate into the design. Um, and so, I, Austin, I would I would ask how how would you like me to proceed? So what with I this? would like to do at this point, 
is to ask for a motion to approve this list as recommended by the design subcommittee. And if there is a motion and a second to approve the list, and my we this will be like the fifth time that this committee has seen this list. So my hope is that we could approve it kind of on block, as they say, rather than going through item by item. But let's get a motion to approve. And then if there's a second, we can then, if anybody has any questions about any of these items, this would be the time to raise them. So Alex. Thanks. I'd actually um, like to discuss two items. Whoa, 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 whoa. What I'd like to do first. So I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase it. I, I'm, I'm, I want to go ahead. Well, go ahead. So, so there are two items that I think can be moved because I've gotten additional information um, since the design meeting. And so I'm hoping to be able to move them into the plausible category as part of the discussion, or I don't know how you want to handle that. So what I think might be the most efficient thing to do is to make a motion to approve the list, then to have a second of that motion, and then we can discuss anything on the list. And if someone wants to make a change and say, I want to amend it this way or that way. Got it. But so moved. So moved. <laughs> well, that Checking was enthusiastic. <laughs> Good. OK. So now the motion has been made and seconded to approve the list on block. Now, if anybody would like to question anything on the list or to say that anything should be moved, now would be the time to do it, Alex. Thank you. Okay, so item number, where is it? Uh, oh, well, yeah, so it's not really here. So I don't think. So one of the discussions during the design subcommittee meeting was the use of synthetic slate versus actual slate um, and that that would have cost savings. And as George very rightly pointed out, um, his experience with Amherst Historic has not been necessarily amenable to that. Um, but uh, the Boltwin Inn used um, uh, sustainable, um, used a synthetic slate. Um, so Sharon and I reached out to Epsilon, our historic tax consultant, and inquired if um, they have seen the use of synthetic slate on historic projects and if they've been able to pursue tax credits. And the answer was yes. So that means that Mass Historic would prove it, and both Amherst Historic and Mass Historic follow the state same state standards. So I don't know what the savings cost is yet, um, but I think that is one that we can move into the plausible category um, based on that information. If and I have a second one as well, but I, I'll, I'll pause talk, there if let's you want. Talk about this one. Okay. So. Uh, the, Craig, do you want to say anything about this question about the slate issue? Um, sh sure. Yeah. So uh, we did not pursue it um, based on the discussion at the design subcommittee that it did not seem uh, plausible. So I didn't ask the cost of mayors for any further information. However, I can and will, and um, hopefully they'll have information to me by tomorrow. The only piece of information that we have at this point is uh, they did give information on um, swapping out the, the real slate for standing seam metal. And that was a, a pretty sizable credit of $320,000. So while we don't know that the exact reduction in cost by going to sy synthetic slate, it does have the potential to be a, a large item. So do you wanna get back to us at our next meeting about the synth synthetic slate? issue and we can kind of leave it to the side and accept that we will come back and discuss it. Would that work for you, Alex? Sure, that's, yeah, either that or I would move it to the accepted and fill in the number when we get it. Well, it's up to you, you want, you want to move it? I, I would like to move it to the accepted and fill in the number. We know it's going to be a savings. We know we can do it. We know what it looks like because you can go over the Boltwood Inn. Um, to me, it seems like, a, a, it seems like it seems like a cut that makes sense because it's a sizable cut. Okay, so there's if if you will, there's a motion to to amend this by moving it to the accepted column. Second. 
good. Okay, Sean. Can I ask a separate question or should we vote on that first? Focus on this one. Is, is that okay? okay? Let's... Yeah, yeah. Come, you can come back to me. Okay, so is there any discussion about this synthetic slate? Craig, do you want to say anything about it? Um, I, I don't have any more information to offer. Sorry. Okay. okay. All right. Any other discussion of this? Uh, I think I see Christine's hand. Christine? Um, yeah, I just want to talk about item, it's item 8 and 8.1, uh, just for people who weren't in the design subcommittee meeting or didn't watch it. Um, so eight, eight is the flat roof and 8.1 is the sawtooth? Yeah. So, yeah, I, so I just wanted to complete the slate thing and then come back to Alex. Could we do that? Oh, I thought we were done with that. Okay. So I just want to get a vote to move it to the accepted. Oh. Okay. Sean? Yes. Alex? Yes. Christine? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Xander? Yes. And Luca. Yes. And Austin votes yes. Now back to Alex. You had another. Okay. I do. So item eight and 8.1, yep. um, there was discussion um, in the design subcommittee meeting about sustainability committee. So I checked in with the engineer on our sustainability committee um, and was told that a flat roof in lieu of a sawtooth is not a sustainability issue. Um, if we have flat solar panels that we add after the fact, they're still going to be able to draw what they need. Um, and uh, in terms of daylighting, we can look at options like solar tubes, which are much less expensive than skylights and still get the daylighting we need. So um, those uh, items, at least from a sustainability standpoint, um, can be put back on the table because I think that's why they weren't being considered. Um, and it sounds like there are some issues to get daylighting in that are much less expensive. Um, so I don't know that we would see the full, uh, what is it, 495 and 250, but those are two pretty significant cuts that I think we could make as well. Uh, Christine, you wanted to speak to those particular items, right? Yeah, I just want to clarify to everyone to make sure everyone knows what they're looking at with those two. And Craig, please. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but so Alex is right. We could go with the whole flat roof, remove all the sawtooth, and it's a savings of four ninety-five, a half a million dollars. And why the two fifty and eight point one was left because that was for the designers to go back and think about. There were supposed to be seven of these, and maybe think about well, what if there were only three or four? Um, there's still another skylight that runs over the um, stairwell kind of area you know, could that be made a little larger um, and other ways to incorporate more light, which would also be opening larger windows, um, uh, mostly on the west side. So Craig, I don't know if, how is the designer going to get back to us on that, you know, so they were weighing that option. Of course, they wanted to leave them, but it's this committee to decide whether it should be half, full, none, Austin, if I may. Sure, please do. The uh, Something we talked about briefly in the design subcommittee was the concept of design to target. And so this would be an example of that. Um, the design team has not yet developed a different scheme, whether it's fewer sawtooths, different sawtooths, uh, no sawtooths with, you know, uh, some combination of skylights or, or daylight tubes um, to be determined. And that is something that will be determined uh, working with a design subcommittee and worked through during design development, the next phase. But what the design team felt confident they could do is uh, whatever scheme they come up with, they felt that they could achieve half of those savings. So that, that's where that $250,000 savings come from. So while we do not know what the end result will be, they feel confident that they can remove a quarter million dollars from the project, cost of the project by manipulating the roof. But that doesn't necessarily mean a commitment to reducing the number of sawtooth elements. Right. They said right. that they'll, they would work on a solution. Um, they, they would target that $250,000 savings, but they don't know what that solution is yet. It's something that would involve more study, more development that um, they, are, you know, they would do in the next phase. 
Sean, I'm sorry, is your hands up for, on this or is it the remainder I, of it? Um, actually, my question was on um, 8.1, but now it's on both 8.0 and 8.1. Please, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And it's pretty simple. I, um, I, I was wondering, is there a way before we vote on these two or maybe not 8.1, but 8.0 if we were to vote on that one, is there a way to see what that looks like or what that impact would be? Um, like examples of it, um, maybe on other buildings. I'm just trying to I'm not, I don't have a good understanding of what the sawtooth, what that looks like on the top of the building. And if we were to make that flat, does that um, change the building in a significant way? It, yeah. um, I actually, they, they um, armed me with some images and renderings that we've seen before, but I'll pull them up for um, reference. Thank you. All right. So what we're seeing in this image, which is the rear of the, the library, is these elements up at the roof are the that sawtooth skylight. So they are, even though it's a roof element, which usually you don't see from the ground, these would be sufficiently tall and close to the edge that they are a part of the aesthetic or the look of the uh, library. Let me see if they included a side image. I don't think they did. But, um, all right, so we know what we can imagine what it would look like without those if we go to that flat roof and that's that 450 um, or 495 thousand dollars savings. These elements are just gone and the new roof line is this gambrel roof flat roof that's all we would see same thing for this wing. Um, beyond that other options for that 250 thousand dollars savings. They don't know what that looks like yet, and so we don't. So we don't have any uh, examples. They haven't even, you know, conceived what it might be. Right. You know, yeah. it, it, you could reasonably say maybe it's fewer sawtooths, maybe it's, um, you know, like a, a light monitors, which are um, protrusions in the roof that have a, a glazed face to them. Maybe it's, you know, flat, um, you know, unitized skylights, sort of a, a layout of those, or a combination. You know, um, do they help or hinder solar panels if we ever were considering solar panels on the roof in any way? Great. I, I, th I think it's um, I think the design team will find a place to put the solar panels in one form or another. So right now, the idea is the solar panels would go on the um, south facing edge, the non glazed slope of these sawtooths. If we have a flat scheme where it's um, uh, a layout of skylights, then the panels would kind of go in between the skylights. We won't have so many skylights, so there's no roof area left. Um, but I, I think the design team will be able to include um, some space or area for photovoltaic mm. panels, future Thank photovoltaic you. panels. Uh, I got Christine and then Alex. Christine? So I'm just hoping the group is thinking, I mean, this is a tough decision. This is you know, the designers are trying to redesign it and obviously they want it to look a certain way, um, but we're trying to figure out whether we should cut a quarter of a million or a half million dollars. So I just want everyone to keep that in mind. And Craig, if you could just show the inside um, rendering, that just helps, like that's the outside, that's helpful, but just, yeah. Uh, I believe Alex was next, Alex. Yeah, so um, just Sean to reiterate, so um, the our engineer who's on our sustainability committee uh, basically said, you know, the solar panels, his words still make juice, even if they're flat. So moving to a flat roof isn't going to change um, our ability to have solar panels on the roof. And again, the solar panels, you know, we just we don't have enough roof space to really produce a whole whole lot <laughs> of, uh, you know, it's not going to be running the building just because we can't put them on the 1928, but we still can add them. Um, for sure. Um, and I misspoke. I said solar tubes, but it's a, a sun tunnel. I guess Velux makes them that was over at River Valley. So in ten, instead of a skylight, you can use, or instead of the, the daylighting, you can use these sun tunnels, which are much less expensive than skylights and the daylights and still get the daylighting in, which I know was one of the primary concerns. And quite frankly, uh, one of the comments we got most in the outreach subcommittee about what people wanted uh, was was natural daylight. So certainly an important thing that we don't want to lose. But I, from what I've been told, I think we can take the, the half million dollar cut and re retain those things. 
So there is a question about the design, which go, goes to the question that Sean raised, which is um, in addition to the, the uh, sustainability, is there something to be said on behalf of the saw, this sawtooth design? And the architects obviously thought there was because uh, they proposed it. Uh, I just wonder before we toss them aside, whether or not we want to think about that from the point of view of design, not just from the point of view of sustainability. Christine. Um, again, if we can go back, Craig, to that internal rendering interior. Um, so we skipped over it, but item one and item two was sort of about changing out and later on, I think it's item 11. Um, what we're looking at here, all that uh, wood ceiling, what we're proposing be gone and we'll focus more on the CLT so it will rise up. I think Craig uh, Ellen had given a picture sort of what that looks like. Uh, yeah, okay, there's some. So you're showing the CLT and you're not hanging um, ceilings below that. So actually this is kind of good. The one on the right shows sort of like a monitor what we're talking about, the sawtooth monitors. And then yep. the one on the lower left is more if you just have a flat ceiling, um, which it is darker, but uh, we do, if you go back to the rendering that uh, our rendering, Craig. So if Craig could point out, so there's a still a skylight that runs down the middle that's still there. We're not talking about that right now, that's still there. We're just talking about the monitors on the far left. And right, are there ways to incorporate more light, either a larger skylight or more windows or these tubes? That's what we're thinking. So when you're looking at this, remember we've already made huge changes. Any other comments about the sawtooth tooth versus the flat roof? So it is, um, as Craig's chart shows a substantial savings. It is also a substantial change in the design. So anything else that anyone wants to say? Um, I take it that the proposal would be, if, am I understanding this, Alex? The proposal is to move the 495 in item eight from not possible into accepted? Is that your yes. proposal? Yes, that is. Okay, so let's have discussion of this. Sharon and then Anika. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, yes, I, I do feel that the architects will um, will be a little disappointed uh, that they, because of the aesthetic, the, the difference, but we're not talking about a savings of, you know, $50,000 or $100,000, it's $500,000. So um, I, I think it's something we should do. Anika? Yes, yeah, so I had a, well, a, along the same lines, but also a question in regards to consequence. Um, I know some pointed out that we've seen this list numerous times, but we're, you know, still, you know, we've had, we have some new information today um, in regards to this, this uh, roof and cut. So I'm wondering um, what, what would be the time frame like, let's, if this uh, list is approved today, um, is that it? Do we, is there a timeline that would allow you know if there are other discoveries made on some you know potential saving costs um, down the line? Is that still a possibility, or would this be final? Thank you, Craig. Um, yes. So Anika, there are um, we'll continue this discussion. Uh, there are some things that we can. Uh, continue to reduce cost on at each phase of the project. Um, you know, the one caveat to that is certain decisions are um, that are made now in this phase are somewhat irreversible. I mean, anything is reversible, but it would cost time and money. Um, an example of that would be, uh, which we talked about in the past, the decision to have uh, mass timber framing over steel. That's something that you decide early in the process. Um, the exterior uh, materials 
um, on the site are something that can be decided very late in the process, uh, in the design process. And so, yes, there will be other opportunities um, later, in later in the design to continue to reduce cost. Anika, your hand is still up. Oh, okay. I just forgot to put it down. No, no, I just didn't know whether you had another question. So the proposal is to move the saw, modifying the sawtooth roof, roof, uh, and to substitute a flat roof in lieu of a sawtooth roof for, to from, not plausible to accepted. Um, is there any further discussion of this? This is a substantial change. This is a some something of a big deal. And the big deal in this, I think the biggest of the big deals are things that go to the integrity of the program. I don't think this goes to the integrity of the program, but it is a substantial change in the conception that has driven the design of this building. And um, I'm just gonna say for myself, I'm a little reluctant to make that change at this point because it does affect the, the whole design. I don't think you just chop off the sawtooth roofs, <laughs> you know, and we got a flat roof. But if people wanna, wanna make it, then we'll, we'll make it. So is there any other discussion of this item number eight? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to vote yes or no. Yes would move it from not plausible to accepted, no would keep it right where it is. Christine. Yes. Alex. Yes. Sharon. Yes. Sean. Yes. Xander. Don't, Xander's not there at the moment. Anika. Yes. Okay, and Austin's gonna vote no. And I'll just tell you why. Um, uh, I, I frankly think that before we make such a change, we should have more consultation with the architects because my worry is that this is gonna ripple. It's not just gonna be the sawtooths are gone. So that's why I voted no, but okay. it will be moved to accepted. Thank you. So any other questions about the items on this list? Okay, if we go forward with this list, Craig, the total that we would have saved would be 1.9 plus million dollars. That's correct. Okay, so we're going to vote now to accept this list, and this list will then be transmitted, right, Craig, to the architects, and the architects will begin to work off of this list. And any subsequent going back to this list, I take it what you said is that we could go back, but it would result in more design work and therefore more, more expense. For certain items. Okay. All right, are we ready to vote? Christine, yes to accept the list as amended, no not to. Yes. Alex. Yes. Sharon. Yes. Sean. Yes. Xander. Yes. Thank you. Anika. Yes. Great, thank you very much. And thank you, Craig, thanks for the List. thanks to everybody for their good work in looking at those items. Craig, yes. I wonder if you can help um, alleviate some confusion about the uh, anticipated cost savings in the project. So I think everybody now needs to have a clear sense of what it is that we're talking about. We have just approved the list that would reduce the cost of the project by 1.9 some odd million dollars. But there are other contemplated cost savings. Is that correct? Yes. What are they? So the uh, one that I've heard, which is uh, very concrete, is reducing the furniture and equipment 
budget um, from, I think it's approximately $2.5 million, reduce it by a million dollars. Um, and when does that decision actually have to be made? That's a decision. Um, so sort of to walk, th walk you through my thought process, the um, furniture and equipment designers have not yet been engaged, but yep. the design team has asked that they be engaged for the start of design development. Um, so my thought is that we should have direction for them uh, at the beginning of design development. So that is a decision that we should make. Um, that is a decision that we should make in, when? In, in the next couple of weeks, as part of the moving, giving them authoriz giving the design team as a whole authorization to move from schematic design to design development. That's a uh, information that they will need at that time. So I believe that this committee needs to be presented with a proposal and a kind of detailed understanding of what would be entailed if we reduce the FF and E by a million dollars. In uh, broad terms, the um, the result would be a lot of the furniture that's existing in the library would be reused in the new library. So I guess, I don't know about anyone else, but um, that's very helpful, but not helpful enough. So I'd really like to know what we're talking about. A lot of the furniture, like what does that mean? And what does it mean in terms of furnishing in the new wing? And what does the reduction in the equipment budget mean? So we've been very careful and very detailed in looking at the list that we just looked at. Mm -hmm. And I just think we need to have a clearer sense of what a reduction in ff &E means. So I wonder if for our next meeting, which hopefully can be in a couple of weeks, uh, if, if that's still timely, is that still timely? Um, yes, assuming it'll take a couple of weeks for the town to give Feingold Alexander the okay to move into DD. We so I, again, this operating is- Operating in parallel. Do, do you all share my sense that we need more detail about this? Okay. Now, uh, Alex, I'm gonna call on you just one sec. So we've got 1.9 that we've approved. We've got another million possible based on a proposal that we haven't yet seen and vetted. Are there any other anticipated cost savings of which we are in control? Um, none that I'm aware of. Okay, so potentially, depending on what we approve, 2.9 million in cost savings uh, that we can control. There are anticipated changes in the escalation estimate. Is that right? So where things stand now, we've based the amount of money for escalation on the cost estimator's best guess. Um, and I think it's at $1.5 million between now and when you know we go into construction in theory you know, next summer or next fall. Um, the market, no one really knows what the market's going to do. So if the market cools off, then that $1.5 million is, uh, you know, we'll see less in escalation cost. And so it's anyone's guess, but um, just as a, a metric, you could say, all right, maybe it's um, 750,000 of that um, is ameliorated by more favorable market conditions. Right, that's a, that's a guess and not in our control. Right. Sean? Right. Craig, is it right that the current number is sort of the midpoint of the two cost estimates that we received from um, RB, RLB, and um, Fennessy? Yes, they were actually pretty close, you know, within a percent of each other where, where they thought okay. things were going to go. Both were clear. They do not think the market's going to reverse. We won't ever see a building that costs less than what we would get today. But, um, you know, there is some hope in the industry that things will, instead of continuing to escalate at the yeah. steep curve, that it will taper off and escalate at a slower pace. Yep. Alex, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, I had a question actually about the, the FF&E budget. Um, you know, in terms of uh, fundraising, you know, who, who knows why people give to what they give to, but I could certainly see somebody who, you know, 
wants the library to have all their furniture, you know? So um, if we have to, if we make a decision and we're hiring designers, right, to this budget of, you know, 1.5 million, and then in two years, somebody comes in and says, you know, I'll pay for what you need for furniture. Like, I don't know how that works. Like whether that is because we're actually using designers. So I, I guess, I don't know if that would happen. It would be lovely, but I'm just curious how that might work. Should someone miraculously want to pay for all the furniture? <laughs> Craig? Oh, um, I, I don't have any, I don't have any uh, particular insight into that. I mean, we would have a plan uh, yes, uh, from the designers yeah. and then would we have to pay them again for a new plan or could we just magically, you know, give Sharon like a wish list and she just starts picking furniture? Like, what is, like, what does that so, look like? So, sorry, I, I, I sort of misunderstood the question. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the design will include a layout and that layout will be filled mostly with existing furniture and then some new pieces in say important areas. And then if the town comes upon um, sort of a windfall of money or someone makes a, a donation or the market changes significantly, what we could do is the, the, you'd pay the design team a little bit more money and then they would redo their plans with more new furniture or all new furniture. But yes, it would be um, a small- An additional cost of design to switch that yeah, out. Okay. I like the Sharon but, wish list option better. I'll be honest. I yeah. think at that point, if the building's underway- Me too. It, it just make, <laughs> I get some things having the designers design, but if it comes down to actually just the furniture itself, um, we should have a conversation whether whether we would need the architects for that. And, and actually part of the um, furniture and equipment design fee is a, a specialist who goes and, and they'll actually pick out the exact pieces of furniture um, and you know help with the procurement of them. Um, and to put it in perspective, the, the design fees, uh, even though it's not formalized yet, but it's around $100,000. And so that's sort of the magnitude of, uh, of cost. So I, I would assume that in the future, more money is available. It would be less than $100,000 to have them redo their plans and add to their procurement package. So let's take up this F of an E and design thing when we're next together. And Craig, if you could give us some more concrete answers to the questions that Alex asked about, well, like, what, what does that involve? What is, that would be helpful. Sure. But Craig, I still want to get clear because I think it's important for everybody to get clear. Based on what we just did, which is 1.9 and a potential $1 million cut that we have not yet approved, what is the estimate of the cost of going forward with the building, the so-called so midpoint estimate, total, including soft costs and anything else? Could you give us that number? I can. Let me quickly calculate. Oh, don't, don't forget our 200 grand or 250 we're going to get for that, that roof. <laughs> Right, so um, we don't know what the number is, but there is another. There is another big number out there. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, not taking into account the uh, the synthetic slate savings. So not taking that, that into account uh, the, but taking into account the uh, value engineering items that we just uh, approved right. and the reduced uh, for F and E budget, uh, we would be at the mid range forty six point five million total project cost. So that's hard costs and soft costs, 46.5 million. The low end? Uh, the low end would be 43.5 million. And the high end? And the high end would be 49.8 million. Okay, so I was hoping that Sean would help us understand how he thinks about these figures, because the figure that he presented to the finance committee was substantially different, I believe. Yeah, it was, it was higher. So, I, and I was going to ask Craig the same thing. I mean, I can only imagine the difference would be in the soft cost estimate. And if you have a better soft cost estimate, you know, I'm happy to use that going forward. But uh, my figures were based on the reconciled hard cost estimate, um, which was originally 38.2 million. And then I subtracted out what we had for original uh, reductions, which was 1.7. So that I would have to adjust for that. Um, 
And then I use for soft costs, sort of the rough percentage that we had in the budget. So our soft cost percentage was 35% of construction um, we had for soft costs. So I applied that same 35%, acknowledging that the soft cost is a, you know, it's not an estimate that we got from an independent cost estimator. Um, so I arrived between those two, between those two at 49.3 million for total project costs. That includes a $1.7 million reduction. So if there's another uh, million, million two or so based on what we did today, that would get me down to 48.1. But again, if you're telling me you have a better method or a, um, a more accurate way of estimating soft costs, we can adjust that. Certainly. So what I did, Sean, um, so on Tuesday, um, I did not have time to sort of go through and, and do an, a, any deeper uh, dive. But then on Wednesday, what I did is I took a more granular look at those soft costs. And that's what that's how I produced uh, the numbers I just quoted. OK, so, so I could you send would, that? Could we get a yeah. break? Could I ask just for a breakdown of that yeah. at some point so we can absolutely. It? OK, thank you. Yep. I think it would. what I was going to say, Sean and Craig, is I think it would be great if you guys got together and kind of reconciled your numbers, because I think what we have now is a lot of different numbers floating out to nobody's fault. There's just a lot of different numbers. And it would be good if the, the OPM who works for the town and the finance director could kind of agree on what the number is, or at least identify if they're gonna be points of disagreement, what, what they are. So if you could do that, that would be, that would be really great. Absolutely. All right. And thank you, Sean. Thanks for the work you did for the for the finance uh, finance committee. Craig, anything else from you? Uh, no, sir. OK, so if it is OK, before we go to the report from the design to the, from the design subcommittee and the outreach subcommittee, I wonder if we could hear from our wonderful town manager. Is that OK with everybody? Paul, it's nice to see you. So Oops, we had. I apologize a, for being late. Not a not not a not a problem. We had on the agenda item number three the town manager's report on the project status, and we were wondering if you would give us the town manager's report on the project status, and then Alex has some questions for you. Okay. <laughs> well, the status is quo. Um, uh, <laughs> the you know we. Before we move to the next step, we have to sign contracts. Um, you know, we've had the conversation um, about with our town attorney about the memorandum of understanding between the town and the trustees. Uh, we've had conversations with um, members of the town council, obviously, um, and they, it, I believe it, it'll be on their agenda for mo Monday's meeting as well. Um, so. Uh, we want to, I want to make sure that we have a strong, a solid funding plan. I'm interested in hearing the um, strategy approach by the fundraising committee. And I think, you know, there's a lot of things that are in, in, uh, in play right now. People are working on multiple different levels at the state level to get the MBLC to own up to it, what its share is and things like that. So I think we're, everybody's working really hard to make sure this project moves forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So the question, one question that was asked uh, earlier, and Alex, I'm going to voice the question, which I think you asked, but if, but, but if I get it wrong, is do you have a pretty clear sense of when the decision that will be made about going forward or not going forward? Um, you know, what I said at the finance committee meeting was that we need to be expeditious about our decision making. And that means we're talking about weeks, not months. Um, and yeah, because we know that every, you know, Alex has really said this every day, it's ticking up and we all are acutely aware of that. Um, and so we want to be moving forward on it and feel comfortable that we can. Again, it's, it's for, for me, it's all about the finance and making sure we are, have a sustainable project and also um, contemplating what happens if the project doesn't succeed. What are the economic consequences of that? Yep. Okay, Alex. Sorry, I had to move my screen. I feel like, I feel like it's a like release the Kraken. Hey, Paul. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? Good. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, timeline, absolutely. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm just 
trying to figure out what the rules of the game are to go forward. And I'm trying to figure out my, my, I don't, you know, I understand that the fund funding plan totally makes sense to me, but there are elements of this that obviously wouldn't be called fundraising if we had the money in hand. Right. So, I mean, there are certain mm-hmm. elements we're not going to be able to get to, but mm-hmm. you know, we do know that we have literally people who professionally fundraise. We have our state and federal legislators behind us a thousand percent to move this forward. Um, you know, we know there's still ARPA money out there. We know that we're getting assistance from both our state and federal legislatures about grants that we're not even aware of, you know, in terms of being able to access, um, you know, whether it's through the arts and humanities or the national down, like there are, there's money out there that, you know, they know more than we do. And so I, and we won't know if we get them, we know that they're available. And so I, I, you know, like, I don't know that anybody's going to be able, I'm just trying to figure out the, the, the waiting each week and the dollar figures going up. Um, for me as a trustee, right? I don't take lightly putting our endowment up at all, at all. And ultimately for me, I made that decision because I am convinced, I could be wrong, but I'm convinced that not moving forward, the library is gonna be in bigger jeopardy financially because of the cost of the building, because of where we'll fall in town. And you know, either town's gonna pay more than they are today, or we're gonna have to take it out of our endowment to repair the building. But neither of those situations seem tenable to me. And and so for me, every delay that we're taking is more that we, the trustees are taking on for our fundraising. So I really, really wanted it, whether it's yes or no, I hope it's yes, but like mm-hmm. it, it's just getting more and more difficult to fundraise. And so my concern is we know we don't have project certainty. We know we don't have cost certainty until we hit that bid, right? And so, who needs what to make that decision to have that certainty? Um, and, you know, as a trustee, I'm willing to make certain commitments to move the project forward, but I'm less if it's not in my control. So either we're both making commitments together, right? You're committing, I'm committing, and we're controlling the process together, or you're committing and you control the process, or we, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm having difficulty with us potentially saying, sure, we'll write a check for $2 million to get us to bid, but then I'm not controlling it going forward. So I don't know whether that means towns taking some of that as well. So they have skin in the game. So it doesn't make sense for them to pull back or whether we come up with sort of concepts around, you know, the project can't exceed X or we like whatever it is, like there needs to be. So I I just, sorry. So, so yeah, <laughs> I mean, all spinning in my head for I mean, now, right? right. So I hear you on that. So, so you said yes or no. I mean, no is an easy answer, and that's that can be done quickly. <laughs> we don't want to go there. That we 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 are we are understanding that that's that's not the desired outcome. Um, but there are some to get to yes is a longer process, and I think that um, you know having that discussion with the trustees about what are you, what is the expectation there in terms of what you're willing to support. Um, the town already is in the, is is in the game on this with the um, you know the, the cost that we've incurred to date. Town owns that we we recognize that there's no request to the trustees for those those funds. Um, you know, so it's the next phase, and we want to be pretty clear about what happens. You know, in, in any eventuality, the last MOU did not anticipate a a project that did not move forward. We need to anticipate that in our next MOU, and we've you know been working with our town attorney to get that kind of language and sharing that out. So, um, you know, you're if you're asked, you're saying, well, how long is this all going to take? Right. That's that's the key thing, and I think it's again, I I can't give you an exact date, but I can say it's forefront in all of our minds and trying to move it fast and fur- fast and furious, but fast forward as quickly as possible is really where we want to go. And I'm, again, I'm not saying we're not waiting. We're, I'm talking about weeks and not months to finalize where we need to be. And a, a lot so of it depends. Say- the people have to make decisions. The trustees have to make decisions, the manager, right? Right. And to make decisions, I feel like I don't have all the information that I need to make a decision, right? And yeah. when you say the town's got skin in the game, right? I mean, our, we cut you a check for half a million dollars, right? So, but we understand we have to return that. Okay, all right. No, that that's that, that, I'm not those are table, don't... I have no idea. So okay, I'm so th- th- those are okay. donations I've been made that in in with the anticipation of there being a success. We assume. I mean, maybe the people who donate that money will say keep it, but my assumption is that the, those donors would expect that funds back 
Sean, is that your expectation? Yeah, no, that, that's definitely the expectation. And I was just going to add that the MOU that we're working on now, Alex, I think will clearly lay out what you're asking for. Um, that's one of the part of the feedback we've received is that it lay out those decision points and in what, you know, what circumstances the project would move forward and what circumstances it might not. Um, so that's why it's taken a little bit of time because it's it's got to kind of consider those different scenarios. Yeah, and I would have all the time in the world if time weren't money. That's that's the part that's, you know, and and again, you know, the clarity is so important because mm -hmm. the dollar number that we're trying to raise, right? The fact that we've raised what we've raised with the project uncertainty is speaks volumes about the group that we have working on our fundraising. But, you know, people are going to be reluctant to give large dollars if they think there's another point where this could go up in smoke, right? There's got to be project certainty that everybody understands. Otherwise, we're jeopardizing our ability to raise funds. Understood. The other thing that I heard Alex say, but again, I may not be hearing her correctly, is that Alex is raising the question about whether or not the financing of the next two phases should fall exclusively to the trustees. Is that right, Alex? Um, raising the question of what either, right? I'm yes, yes, because I if it falls explicitly to us and then there aren't right, there aren't controls around what that means, then I'm not comfortable doing that, right? If we're doing it, so there's got to be either the two of us in it together on a moving forward basis, or so I just want to understand the mechanisms of how it works. Okay, great. Okay, any other questions for the town manager about the project update? And thank you, Paul, so far. Xander. Um, one more thing I would just add, I've heard Alex bring up uh, before, is that if there is no new Jones Library, like if this project does not go through, it does not mean that we don't have a library project, right? There are significant repairs and upkeep that need to happen. Um, and the impressions that I've gotten from Alex and uh, others that those are pressing matters. Um, so I would just encourage that in whatever the MOU is, that uh, it is also stipulated that like, if our trustees are gonna sink so much money into the next two phases, um, where is the money coming from? Mm -hmm they are then tasked with repairing a building that they're stuck with. That's a really good point, Xander, and something we have considered as well. Thank you, Xander. Okay, any other questions to the town manager? I, As I understand, Paul, what you said, and I think it's, it's important to say it again, there is work about uh, on this project going on on many fronts. The town manager and the town council, the finance committee. There was a meeting that Sharon, we talked about earlier with uh, state representatives today about state funding. There's a letter that went from Deerfield that named Amherst that went to the governor for opera funds. So, and there's a trustees, uh, the trustees will meet uh, hopefully soon. Uh, to discuss um, where the trustees stand on all of this. Uh, so there are a lot of people, the finance director, the finance committee. My question, you may not be able to answer, but again, I, it's just inspired by Alex's. Um, there is a finance committee meeting scheduled. There's a town meeting, a town council meeting on the 12th. Mm -hmm. There's a finance committee, and then there's a town council meeting on the 19th. Correct. Uh, is that the point at which one thinks uh, a decision is likely to be made or is it likely to be much beyond that? And if the answer is you really don't know because you've said it's weeks. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to pre uh, predict what the council will do. That would okay. that'd be the council president who should do that. Okay, thank you so much. Xander, are you, is that the same question or a different one? Xander? Oops, I apologize. It uh, it was the same question. I can okay. put my hand down. Um, I also am going to have to disconnect for just a minute here. Okay. Thank you, Xander. Christine. Make sure it's a rainbow. You're muted, Christine. On it, not not for this one. No, this is one. Anika, you are not muted. Subtle, 
my question is for Craig and your lovely timeline. So with all this talk, and if there was like a, I heard town council meeting on the 19th, you know, so it sounds like it may not be till maybe the end of the month when things are actually all coming together and gelling. What does that do to our schedule? Like, is that the hatch mark stuff you had in or does it have to expand even more to get into DD? Greg? Uh, it, it would um, continue to um, slide. So basically for each week that um, we have not given the design team direction to move into DD, it's a sort of week that gets tacked on to each step. So the overall duration stays the same, but it just slides um, further into the future. So on your timeline, what is the date that you're assuming we move on? I haven't made an assumption about that. I'm just showing sort of where we are today. Here, I'll show quickly. So if, you know, and I understand that the, this is not the process, but if, you know, tonight uh, the town directed Feingold Alexander to move into design development, this is how things would look, these um, striped, lot, striped shapes. So, you know, they've got six weeks more um, kind of rework that needs to be done to sort of, or that can be rolled into design development. So let's just say the design development would end in February of 2023, construction documents would end in September of 2023, uh, and so on. So this is, if we give them the go ahead today, this is what it looks like. If it's another week, if it's another month, it just, everything moves out by that week or by that month. So we're sense? looking at a minimum of three weeks right now. Is that what I'm hearing from people today? Um, we're at, at present, we're about five weeks behind schedule. At, at present, but that's, I'm trying to get, you're saying snapshot today. Yep. If the town keeps having to work through all these important options. So if it isn't till the end of September that we get the go ahead from the town and everybody's in agreement, then that, those blue stripes push out another. Right, another four weeks. Another four weeks. You got it. Okay. And if I may, Christine, pick up on a point that you, um, I think that is implied, this goes to what Alex was talking about. So we need to look at that chart to make sure that we understand that if we go forward, if the town decides and the trustees decide to go forward, to bid documents, when would we, right? If we were making the decision right now, when would we get those bids? Uh, the very end of 2023. So the end of December of 2023. And um, again, end of December. So if we're a month from now, it'll be the end of January at the best. Exactly. Right. So we're into maybe 2024 before a decision, another decision would be would be made. And th at that point, again, Paul and Sean, but Paul, at that point, if if there needed to be new borrowing, uh, would that then require, what would that require in terms of town decision? It would require a few, I'll go ahead, Paul, so. No, go ahead, Sean. It would require, you know, uh, we'd have to raise it with the council, and have to go to the finance committee, there would have to be a, a, a hearing or forum um, and then it will have to go back to the council for a vote so you know you're probably talking a, a minimum of three weeks um, for that process right Alex so that's your that's the answer to the other part of your question about like what what is the decision going to look, look like and it looks like at this point um, at the earliest we're going to be in the late winter or early spring of 2024 okay so, any other questions for the man? Christine, are you? All right, Christine, do you have a question? No, I'm all set. Okay. All right. Nothing else for the manager? Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Thanks for the work that you and Sean and everybody in the town is doing in all the conversations. I want to reiterate what Alex said. We're incredibly grateful to the people who have put in an incredible amount of time in the fundraising effort. We're incredibly grateful to the many, many citizens in Amherst who have donated, pledged, 
uh, worked for, supported um, this, um, this project. And as we're all well aware, Alex made this point, uh, it's not a question of what we do for the library. It, it's not a question of whether we do something for the library. It's a question of what we do uh, to, to deal with the needs of the library. Okay, Christine, next item, report from the design committee. I don't really have anything more to, we went Great. over the, the value management list and we do not have another meeting scheduled. Great, thank you so much. Alex, anything from outreach? Uh, nope, not at this time. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sharon, I was going to ask you, when is our next scheduled meeting? You know. So our next scheduled meeting, we have been meeting on, the t on Tuesdays um, that Tuesday is difficult for me. Could we meet on the 22nd of September at four o'clock? Does that work? That's a Thursday. That's two weeks from today. Um, we have a we have a building and facilities meeting. I don't know if Sharon, I don't know if we can reschedule. I can try and reschedule that because this would take priority for me over that. Yeah. Sharon, could we look to uh, to schedule our next JLBC meeting on the, the 22nd? which is a Thursday at four o'clock. You're muted. And then reschedule, and then reschedule BNF. All right, okay, hang on, let me just make sure. Okay, JLBC the 22nd at 4 p.m. I see, yes, we could do that. Okay, so if people would um, put in a JLBC meeting for the 22nd at four o'clock, Sharon will and yes. Angie will be in touch uh, with everybody to make sure it's on their calendar. Okay, I have received no correspondence. Uh, I, I know the only topic I knew of, not anticipated by the chair, 48 hours in advance, was a, a report on the meeting today, which Sharon gave uh, uh, concerning the uh, efforts to secure state funding. Uh, next is public comment. So we have eight attendees, again, express our gratitude for uh, your attendance. Uh, if anybody would like to speak, make a public comment, please signify by raising your virtual hand. Okay, I see no virtual hands. No public comment. Again, thanks to all for coming. Thanks to Angie for setting it up and invoking the Bachelman rule, I declare this meeting adjourned. Bye.